Thank you. That I ended my presentation with, and that's what are the values here? And in particular, I'd like you to think 100 years from now, what do you want people to say about the woodlands that you are working on in your places? When they look at it the way we talk about, you know, Olmsted and Vox, and we talk about the values that they were trying to create, and that maybe we're trying to restore or bring back, I don't know, what do you want them to say about the, the Forrest, Bolin, Zimmerman views of the woodlands you manage today? Um, I guess for our forest, I want them to say that it still exists, <laughs> that it's a place they, that they can, that they have learned about how beautiful, complex, fragile, and inspiring nature is. Yeah, ditto. Ditto. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I guess, I, I guess I'd add one other, oh, okay. I'd add one other thing. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I feel like parks have always been on the lead edge around innovations in the world. And I've, I, I would love it if uh, in the future, uh, when people thought about what we're all working on in our parks right now, that we were the lead edge of a movement that is about reintroducing vibrant ecological systems to the developed parts of our planet. Uh, you know, the wilderness is already protected, and so I feel like for all of us, the future of wildlife and biodiversity is really in developed areas. And I feel like parks can be the lead edge of that. Uh, and that that's really what we're all talking about today, you know, is how do you reconcile these things? So I would love it if people came to our forest and said that, and it still existed. So <laughs> I'll ditty on that. May, may I just say, and we can argue about this over lunch, but the wilderness is not protected worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, <laughs> from my perspective. Yeah. You know. Um, I would have to say that, that the Olmsted and Vox design, at least in my particular case, it still works. Um, it worked originally, it definitely has to be taken care of, but the design is an amazing design, as is Central Park's design. I mean, they're, it's a brilliant design, and they're still relevant. They were relevant a, a hundred years ago, they're relevant today, and I think in another hundred years, the woods, the water, the meadow will still be relevant, and people will still be coming to it to recuperate, to relax, to rest, and the woods is an integral part of that. No, that's right. That's right. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I know in my own work I try and find timelessness, right? I mean, I think that's part of what we're looking for is, uh, is something that, that lasts, but, but lasts not because it forecloses opportunity, but actually opens up opportunities for the future. So um, I have one more question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, I'm curious how you see your places fitting into the larger landscape of the cities that you're in. So, so you know, each of your institutions work with a set of institutions, but you're really focused on specific landscapes, specific places. But, you know, what are the decisions that you're making at Prospect Park? How does that relate to decisions that the New York Botanical Garden is making? Or, or the decisions you're making, how does that relate to what's going on in Marin or in Golden Gate Park? Um, you know, how do, how do, how do we, and particularly how do you as public practitioners of landscape design and historic parklands think about your work in the sort of next scale up, the larger context of the, of the places you live? Uh, Chris John, you want to start? I think, you know, I'm just one person, we're just one park, but we're a network of all these park properties, reserves, all this land, and, um, you know, we all need to get that message out, all the restoration. I mean, you see, we're different properties, and, but we're all doing similar things. We may be doing it in a different way, but we need to get the message out to the larger population. And I think that's what the Prospect Park Alliance is for, is to get, at least for Brooklyn, get the message out that you need to take care of park property, public lands, it's your land, um, and, uh, and maintain it, and we need to restore it, and hold it dear, but it's a living, breathing thing. And as a mass of people and practitioners, we need to kind of keep together and not be divisive, but, but kind of promote it as one big piece that, you know, stronger together. Indeed, we are stronger together. I guess I'll follow up as a local, uh, another Atterboro person. I, I, the cliche is that uh, green spaces are the lungs of a, of a great city. Um, 
and New York truly couldn't have been considered great until Central Park was created, until Prospect Park was created, until the parks in the Bronx were preserved and, and enhanced. Um, in addition, I like to think that these green spaces, particularly those that have some lens into nature, some window into nature in them, um, are also kind of the soul of the city. They, they, they keep remind us that humans, that people, um, are part of nature and not over nature. And I think collectively, uh, if we all believe that about what we have to offer and we, um, and we get the word out, not only about our own landscapes, uh, but also our sister landscapes throughout the city, I think we'll be doing a great and permanent good for the city. Yeah, you know, I, I think you've asked a really interesting question, and um, I, I frankly think we're not doing a very good job of it. Uh, I think generally parks don't. Um, I think we're all, you know, so busy trying to survive uh, that in a lot of ways we're, we tend to be, at least in the West, uh, very inwardly focused. Uh, and, and, you know, in the West there's this funny mosaic of land ownership. So, you know, we have city parks and state parks and regional parks and national parks all bumping up next to each other, preserving parts of watersheds and things like that. And what I find generally is that those organizations don't collaborate nearly as well as they should, uh, and they have different mandates, and so they're preserving to different value sets, and it creates all kinds of missed opportunities for how different entities can come together to steward you know, wildlife, which of course you know, doesn't understand the boundaries between a state park or a national park or anything like that. So, uh, I actually think you've really asked a, a pretty interesting question. I think we all are doing good work and share a lot of similar objectives way out here, but I think there's a lot of good collaboration that could happen right here uh, and, and doesn't. It's ironic that I, I think there's better collaboration, at least out west, around trail construction. So, for example, around San Francisco Bay, there's a bay trail, and all the land management agencies have a very easy time getting organized around the goal of creating one continuous trail corridor but nobody talks about creating a, you know, the Pacific Flyway, thinking about the Pacific Flyway in ecological terms and how all of the park units that are located along it through the region, you know, through the urban core can actually work together to you know, promote the movement of wildlife through it or anything like that. So I think there's a lot of work, actually, really fertile work around that question uh, that you've asked. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's right. It, it, it's interesting to me as a kind of outside observer of these things how how some of the phenomena that require connectivity can, can create the structures to make that connectivity happen, like, like trails, or I'm also thinking in the New York City context of the, the Department of Environmental Protection's green infrastructure plan, which is about money to build green infrastructure so they don't have to build big cement infrastructure for stormwater. But buried in that plan is um, an obligation that the, that the DEP, the Parks Department, the um, city planning department and transportation department will actually all coordinate their long-term plans together because the cities have problems where you know parks and DP will get together to make a bioswale somewhere and then DOT will come along and repave that street and pave over half of it and uh, you know if they just planned ahead they could coordinate things and and if you know it's just like you say you know we we talk so much about the divide between nature and people and that sort of thing but but ultimately we're always always managing people and we're always talking to people and then nature kind of fits in around us you know I think that's you know our relationship to the whole web isn't only about looking out to the web but actually l managing our network of relationships I think included in that what I've noticed being in Prospect Park for 22 years is that um, you constantly need to keep educating people. Our memory, our history is so short. We have just such short memories. So you can put all of that in, but somebody has to keep reminding people that, oh, we did put this in here. You know, there's a reason. So, you know, the four agencies maybe wrote that document, but it needs to be alive and somebody needs to keep, yeah. keep it alive. Well, that's right. And I think, uh, I don't know how many city people are here, but that's what they're worried about with the change in administration that's coming is, um, you know, how do you make those kind of systems or plan NYC or the growth in the natural resources group, how do you make those, or million trees, how do you make those kind of phenomena last into the future? All right, so with that, I'd like some ideas and comments from the audience about how do we make our woodlands last into the future? Um, Charles, would you like to lead us off? 
I, I won't be shy. Um, as, as I watched this morning, beginning with Chris, I couldn't help as a former New Yorker and a person who was here in the 80s to think about how this whole movement began really with a capital projects mentality, you know, the object in the landscape that we could wrap our hands around. And with Todd on the panel, really with the Thine Woodlands project and Michael's confessional of um, now being off on your own, um, no more government support, and with Christian being concerned about the park being loved to death. I'm kind of curious um, from your perspectives as stewards how you get patrons. I mean, here we are celebrating landscape and patronage last night with Judy Carson. How do we get patrons to understand the dynamism, the complexity? Um, it's not a building, it's not a bridge. Um, how do you get people to support something that is dynamic and difficult to wrap your hands around? Um, I guess from my experience, if you are genuinely enthusiastic as a, an advocate or supporter or as a representative of, of one of these spaces um, and knowledgeable and humble about it, there are many people out there who will share your passion. Um, you just have to get a few minutes with them in that space and allow your true enthusiasm, your true knowledge and your true passion to come through. because. Our culture is incredible for the level to which people support things that they value. Um, and each of our, maybe not the Presidio, but certainly Prospect Park and NYBG exist today as they do only because of the, the incredible support of people outside of the institutions or the organizations. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, ditto on that too. Um, uh, but just another thing, I mean, the, the San Francisco donor community, philanthropic community is incredibly generous. And so we're, uh, we benefit from that generosity uh, in part because the park is so well situated relative to the donor community. So a lot of the most generous donors in town have a, the, the park is actually a part of their daily experience. Uh, we've created trails that connect those neighborhoods into the park so that people are walking their dogs or going for their morning runs. I run into the, the, uh, the husband of our senior senator uh, every few weeks out on the trail jogging or walking his dog. So, you know, we, you know, part of it is about creating a wonderful experience for those communities. That's another piece of it. But I find that more and more donors are really interested in the impact of their investments. And so, for example, our education programs are a very attractive way to link donors to the resources we're trying to steward because so much of the education work we do is resource-based. We try to Im immerse young people, particularly young people, but all kinds of folks, in the resources of the park, give them a hands-on experience and use that a as a way of uh, you know, strengthening their uh, educational experiences in their schools. Um, and, and donors are looking for that. They want, ha they want their investments to have an impact, not only an impact that is uh, going to benefit their experience, so building a trail, but make the city a better place and think about future generations. And so we found that education and educational opportunities are a really powerful connecting device that we can use with the donor community to engage them. And we've benefited. Uh, our whole trails program was built through the generosity of philanthropists, of course, the transformation of Chrissy Field, uh, 100, the 100-acre northern waterfront of the post was all funded philanthropically. So most of the really uh, outstanding park transformation projects that we've been able to accomplish in our first 15 years when we've been so focused on revenue generation have happened because of donor investments. So donors have played a really critical role in our park. Yeah, um, Prospect Park's in a really interesting situation right now, um, and the Prospect Park Alliance, in the sense that two-thirds of the park's funding is by the Prospect Park Alliance, and the general public doesn't know that. We've always been pretty quiet when Tupper was in charge. She wanted to blur the line, and it was really just Prospect Park. It wasn't city employees, alliance employees, you, everyone, we just wanted it all to be the parks department and it was the parks property. Uh, as the city budgets have been more and more constrained and they reduce and reduce, the alliance has had to essentially, and donors, raise funds to support the park because the city just doesn't have it. And it's only recently, I guess it's the last year and a half, that we've been able to announce that Two-thirds of the funding is the Prospect Park Alliance. It's members like you that do this. And if you, when we started interviewing people and questioning, we do some um, polling, just one of the, very small one, they 
they interviewed five or 45 people running in the park. Six of them knew who the Prospect Park Alliance was. Six out of 45, and these are people who run the park, so they know it. They see the logo, they see. So it, there just is this disconnect. And what we're finding out now is we really need to get out there and support this park because the city is, their budget will always be constrained. It just will, and it's whatever the resources. I think uh, what's a very fascinating thing, um, my boss, Emily Lloyd, who was, she's now the administrator of the park, and she came from a number of different backgrounds, but she was the commissioner of Department, Department of Environmental Protection. She also was the Department of Sanitation. So she was a commissioner in these very large agencies, and she, through her career, she saw all of that. But what she found interesting in city government is those agencies have a floor, whether it's through environmental mandates, legal mandates, you have state and federal laws, you know, you have to, your water quality, DEP has to, it doesn't have a floor, you know, or it has a floor. You, have, you can't go any lower, it has to set up, and sanitation, you need to be able to plow the streets, snow removal, emergency, all these agencies, DOT, DP, um, police department, fire department, parks department, there's no floor. There's no federal mandate that a city park has to exist. There's no state mandate that a city park has to exist. So when it comes to funding, culturals and parks department, where are you going to go? You know, so I don't know, maybe we should make federal mandate out of city parks <laughs> somehow. But it's just, so that's what we keep saying to people now. You need to support us, because, and, and it's all parks. Really close. Really close? Is that close? Um, I was very interested in what you said about working across legal boundaries, state, municipal, BLM, whatever. Um, I, was, I, saw, I was very impressed by the estuary work that's being done, um, you know, north of San Francisco, and uh, I've noticed a lot of really interesting work being done by the NOAA across the country in estuarine research reserves. And each of these places, because the estuarine is obviously flows across boundaries, work with um, a lot of different organizations to get stuff accomplished and use that agenda also to educate. And um, I think in each one of these instances, parks do not, they're not in a vacuum. So to identify the forest of, you know, the New York City region and to understand that each of these places are part of a forest and, and, and it's almost like, I hate to say the word branding, but attention to a forest and regeneration as not just in one place and get people um, to look at that and the same thing with wildlife. I think you're talking about so many different kinds of things in every single park, but we all, we're also talking about knitting together systems um, and I just, I just uh, you know, ask about how do we look at systems and identify them that larger groups of people in larger places can understand they're all interconnected. So from your forest to your forest to your forest, etc. Is that something to consider in terms of reaching out to other organizations? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> but 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 no, actually, um, more seriously, you know, there's some uh, in San Francisco. You you point rightly to a number of really great great examples. Uh, I think water is sort of like there. It's like trails. You know, it, it moves uh, and, and is a great connector of things um, in the same way that urban fabric actually does that. But in, in uh, San Francisco, for example, there are some really exciting community-based efforts underway. So for example, there's uh, an effort to create a green hair streak, which is a butterfly, a green hair streak corridor that runs through town and uses, and, and it's basically about teaching homeowners to plant the nectar plants and the habitat plants for this one butterfly species to create a continuous corridor right through town uh, that connects some contiguous uh, remnant open spaces where the, those butterflies are found. Uh, we used to actually jointly, we used to collaborate with Golden Gate Park, uh, which is a, the other park I mentioned in town, uh, because we between us had the last remaining population of California quail. And they would actually, believe it or not, this little chubby bird that flies very badly would go through San Francisco and migrate back and forth between the two parks. Of course, they are no more, and you can, under, you can imagine why. Um, you know, the challenge of feral cats, and I mean, the population, you know, for 50 years kept declining and declining, and 
ultimately was gone, but we're now working jointly on a plan to improve the habitat between our parks, to create a similar kind of corridor so that we can reintroduce the quail, which is our state bird, uh, to both parks and facilitate uh, the movement of the population back and forth to make it sustainable. So we are starting to work on, on some elements of that. Uh, we work on it in terms of endangered species protection. Those endangered species that we have, we're trying to establish populations on other land in the city that is compatible but not managed by the National Park Service, for example, city park land. So, there are some elements of that, but I think what you're talking about, we're a long way from what you're talking about, which is sort of holistic intergovernmental planning around creating vibrant natural systems sort of at a meta level. Uh, I, I know in the West, we're just way too, it's the West, you know, where it's the frontier mindset and we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're just not organized in that way. You know, we have 30 different bus systems in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, which still boggles my mind. So. Uh, there isn't that sense of the whole out there that there may be, I think, here in the East. Um, the, the Parks Department has the Natural Resources Group, NRG, and they're working citywide at all their public properties. So there is, there, and that's still just New York City, but um, so there is an effort that's still just small that it's New York City, but it, the Parks Department does have that, and they're trying to create that. I think if you went back to an Olmstead design where you create these parkways that are all linked by, they're all linked to other parklands, I mean, if you think about it, that's all green space. So they're green corridors. So if you could, we could go into that kind of detail again. I know Eric is planning the city of the future, and there's uh, great connections between all these places. <laughs> well, thank you, Todd. Actually, um, you all will be contributing to the city of the future. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention and pick you up with Chris John said that there is a new organization for me, a private organization, the Nature Areas the Natural Areas Conservancy of the city is public-private. It's built on the model of Prospect Park, Park Alliance, Con Central Park Conservancy, but its mission is to focus on this network of natural areas across New York City and ask these kinds of questions for the city. Uh, do we have time for one more, Lane? Okay, one more excellent question or comment from the audience. Come on. You put too much pressure on. There it is. The perfect question's coming. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think everyone who spoke today has mentioned uh, controversy with the public with different efforts for restoration, and I'm just wondering, what have you found to be the most successful strategies and educational outlets? Um, is it signage or is it holding conferences or, or what's, the, what's the best way? That is the perfect question. Well, we're still trying to figure that out. It depends on the, on the controversy. Um, so the most important thing is to have conversations with actual people who care, um, rather than you know, to exchange platitudes through a third party. Um, so meet with, uh, in our case, we have passionate bird watchers um, who use the garden regularly and use the forest regularly, and we know them and we meet with them and we ask for their help to help us better understand our birds and we ask for their understanding um, as we go forward in restoring the garden as a cultural landscape um, and we hope we teach them about what we're doing. So conversations person to person are key. Yeah, I would say uh, site-based conversation is essential. It's better than anything else. I mean, getting people out in the park explaining the values, explaining the challenges, and making it very tangible, and also being able to show them uh, places where you've already done the thing you're proposing to do, the sort of the value of the object lesson, uh, is enormous. Uh, so much better than public, you know, we always default in government to these sort of huge public meetings and offices somewhere and stuffy rooms, and they're a disaster, always a disaster. So uh, I spend a lot of my time out in the park meeting with members of the public, having conversation, and um, you know, just trying to explain our rationale. And then being, I think the corollary to that is being open to change. Uh, you know, if somebody feels incredibly strongly about that tree or that tree, that we shouldn't be such purists that we can't rethink our own attitudes and meet the public halfway. So it has to be an honest dialogue out in the park, not a sort of just get them, you know, get it, go through the ropes or go through the steps and try to, you know, manage the controversy so you can do what you want, which I think a lot of public process is really that. So. The old adage, fences make good neighbors. 
um, just just kind of it does work. Um, it's not our permanent solution, but but in more serious note, we constantly are talking to the public and edu educating the public. New York City is constantly cycling through people. I mean, the Brooklyn neighborhoods that I saw 20 years ago are different than 10 years ago that are different today. It just And those people come into the park. One of the things that we see in the park is you see somebody that moved to the neighborhood, they see that waterfall and they think it's always been there. It's always been there because that's what they know. So we are constantly giving tours. We're always available to that. Um, we have the old photographs. We say that used to be this. And it's labor intensive. It's really intensive. And it has to constantly be done because you need to keep reminding people or teaching people who moved into the neighborhood that their resource that they're looking at is not, is finite. It, you need to take care of it. So, and they're, they very much get it. When you, when you just talk to the people on that level, they're very much, they understand. I mean, there's always the 1% that will jump the fence, break something, carve something, but we're looking at the other group that we're really trying to take on. And they also self-police. Um, so, so to end with Robert Frost, is Christian Lettis. So there's something there is that doesn't love a wall, or, or some, some fences get good neighbors, but something there is that doesn't love a wall, and particularly the walls between each of us. So, and I think in that way, the presentations this morning were a fantastic example of how to manage woodlands in an urban context and make them work uh, for people and for nature. So thank you very much.